We will do our best, and thank you very much for having the hearing, and thanks to your staff for having put such a great group of people together. Uh, my name is Lori Weyburn. I am president and uh, co-founder of the Pacific Forest Trust. Our organization is uh, committed to conserving forest resources for all the benefits that they provide uh, through building a regenerative forest economy that sustains people and the planet in this era of climate change. So we've seen today fire is a dominant force in our watersheds either for ill, as we saw so much in 2017 and 18, or for good, as we are increasingly seeking to do with prescribed fire. Uh, fire, flood, and drought are dominant forces in our watersheds, and today you might be forgiven for thinking that we were back in 2017 with the breach of the Oroville Dam. But how our watersheds function uh, is highly determinative of the amount of water that we have. Uh, the water that flows into our reservoir is what determines how much water we use. Um, and so by putting our watersheds in better shape, we can not only uh, improve the total amount and quality and timing of our water, but we can also have benefits across the boards in terms of mitigation, adaptation to climate change uh, for wildlife, for people, and for sustainable economies. So California has perhaps the most sophisticated and complex plumbing system in the world. And we move water, as you know, uh, 600 plus miles from the north down to the south. One of the things that Dr. Thurm was pointing out earlier today is that some watersheds have impacts that are not just local, but they are ripple across the state. And therefore, we want to look at impacts not only locally, as you're pointing out in terms of metrics on the ground, but have we achieved what we wanted to do? And this northern region of the state, both over the past 100 years and projected going forward, remains wetter and cooler than the rest of the state. And indeed, within that area, there are five key watersheds that are the backbone of the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. Those five key watersheds fill the deepest reservoir in the country and the largest reservoir in the country, and they, that being the Shasta and the Oroville, but that's also the source of water for the San Luis Reservoir, for the Los Vaqueros. Mm -hmm. So this area of the state is what is core to drinking water for over 28 million Californians to all of our irrigated agricultural lands and for our industrial uses. That's an enormous amount of dependence upon just those 7 million acres. Um, as our population continues to grow and is concentrated in urban areas, that reliance will be even more so because the central and south part of the state continues to warm and dry. So when we look at this, and I, I also want to mention this, this provides 7% of the power for the state through the hydroelectric capacity of these projects. When we look at this, we recognize that that suboptimal watershed condition that we have threatens not only our air quality through the fires, but our water supply, and that we have to approach it as a whole. And that's come through in many of the comments from this morning. Um, even scaling up, we are still well below the scale that we need to be at when you look at 7 million acres. And coordinating investments and activities across those 7 million acres really requires a different way of thinking about how we approach our watersheds. And that way of thinking really is closer to what we commonly use in infrastructure planning. So if you're planning to build a dam, you don't say, gee, I'm going to put down a ton of concrete this year. In five years, I'll put down another ton of concrete. And then maybe I'll order the rebar and, oh, I should have some people lined up for this too. You would say, let's look at this as a whole, top to bottom, identify our labor needs, our project specifics, and what's the financing that we have to have behind that? And I bring that up because even with a billion dollars across the state, it's very little. What we need to be looking at is billions of dollars, as we do in infrastructure projects, and we never blink an eye. So there are a couple of new uh, tools that we have in the toolbox now. AB 2480, which was Mr. Bloom's bill in 2016, actually codified that watersheds are part of the water system infrastructure for the state and enabled us to be thinking it in that way. AB 2551 uh, last year put in place a call for planning at that level to have an implementation plan to move ahead, in particular in this region. 
And then there's a new federal tool that I want to flag because I think it's extremely important, and that's the Water Infrastructure Innovation Act. And that is something that is providing new federal grants and financing for watersheds along with the Water Infrastructure Financing and Innovation Act, or WIFIA. These are key tools that can scale up the amount of money that we have at our disposal to do this. We know that we need to take our young homogenous forests and return them to a more resilient state which produces more water as well as stores more carbon. Doing this can capture more than 70% of the snow that currently evaporates on the top of these forests as well as capture more water through having the kinds of turbulence that catches clouds and milks them in a way that can increase water by 10 to 25% of what comes in within those watersheds. That's significant. If we restore our streams, we can hold the water longer, we can take the sediment out of it, and we can recharge groundwater. We can also reduce flood intensity when we combine that with restoring wet meadows. This can reduce the flood impacts by anywhere from 12 to 40 percent. So you can think back on the Oroville and go, gosh, if we'd had that in place and we had a more natural hydrograph, would we have had that disaster? Um, this is key here in light of the campfire and the rim fire. The slide that is on the left, that is the amount of sediment that came down from the rim fire the year after that catastrophe occurred. We also need to keep our watersheds whole, thinking of this as infrastructure and not fragmenting them further, not developing in places that we don't want to develop, and we want to work with the whole. This is the Feather River uh, watershed. It's a large area to come down to that little reservoir. How does one work with that? Well, the great thing about tools that we have today in our mapping is that we can look at things from space and analyze them. This is a part of an analysis that we've done of the 7 million acres. It tells you where do we need to work on these streams. And that, for example, provides a good tool to then build upon and say, what are the specifics of a project? Are we delivering on that project? Can we track that back on the ground and show the progress that we have made? Um, as we've heard many times today, managing across the checkerboard of ownerships in a coordinated fashion is absolutely essential. Obviously, what's on the left is the map. What's on the right is the actual landscape. And you can see that the differences in ownership lead to vastly different management outcomes, which leads to different water as well as climate and fire outcomes. So I want to bring this down to a specific and um, show how all these things can come together. One of the emphases that we have here is working with our natural infrastructure for water security outcomes and for climate outcomes. Uh, the natural approach to enhancing water security we can look at within the Shasta. A number of you are probably familiar with the uh, Trump administration's move ahead to raise the Shasta Dam. They have used $20 million from the WIN Act to do planning on that to move ahead. And you can see on the lower left, this is what will happen, this is what is projected to happen when we raise the Shasta Dam, if we follow that. It's, of course, illegal under California law, but it has been moving ahead nonetheless. There will be zero inflow increase. And as I said earlier, what flows into our watersheds, into, from our watersheds into the dams, is the additional water we have there will be no more water. There will be no specified flood protection. There'll be 7,500 job years. The impacts on fish will be negative, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service. The impacts on climate change will be negative. It will increase emissions. It will rarely have any increase in summer cold water, which is the water we most need. It's the most expensive for agriculture. It's what's most needed for fish. And the increased storage is possible perhaps a third of the time. Under a natural approach, the inflow increase will be on average 450,000 acre feet per year, every year. It'll vary year to year, but that's the average. We can reduce flood intensity by 12 to 40 percent. The fire benefits, we were calculating these prior to 2018, so we don't have all the numbers that are to date, but through 2017, we would save at least $120 million a year. We have 33,717 job year increases, significant in terms of these rural economies and the circulation of dollars within rural economies. Many of these actually fall in the most depressed, not only in the state, but in the country. Significant benefits for fish, 
a clear extension of cold summer water by two to three weeks and increased storage in terms of the total benefits that are there. Now, we know that working with uh, natural infrastructure is cheaper. Um, and Ann Bartuska will be discussing this further, but I just want to flag here, when we look at the costs, this is from New York City, it's a classic example, let's look at the cost of Oroville, a billion dollars in emergency costs. It's estimated to be 2.25 to 2.75 billion dollars in repair, of which we've spent 1.25 already. When you look at the cost of the Shasta Rays, it's very conservatively estimated at 1.5 billion in 2018 dollars. That's almost $5 billion. For $4 billion, we could restore the entire watershed of this area, this entire 7 million acres. Now, in addition, we would have more water. We would have less cost in terms of firefighting. We would not have the impacts in terms of loss of, uh, you know, I-5 transportation as happened with the fires this year. You know, four of the state's five mega fires were in this region this year, half a million acres. We spent $405 million just in this region. So the benefits of working with natural infrastructure are manifest with this. Um, I want to take a minute to focus in on what Rachel Ehlers was talking about. Who's currently paying for these watersheds? The people that are here in this room, taxpayers and private landowners. We did this analysis solely on the kinds of costs that are covered under AB 2480 that are designed to restore function to watersheds. And so what we can see is almost $250 million a year. And again, this was as of 2017. We took an average over the past 20 years of what those costs are. They have been escalating every year. The question is, who benefits? Um, well, I think that one of the pieces here that is missing, and Rachel was referring to this, is that the two key benefactors of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project, which are the backbone of our system, are water contractors and hydroelectric. During the drought for four years, the cost of PG&E to ratepayers went up by $2.7 billion. The cost of water in agriculture went up from $140 an acre foot to almost $1,400 an acre foot. So clearly those entities do pay in a time of emergency. I guess the question is, could we pay significantly less, but in a much more thoughtful way, and financed as we finance infrastructure, if we included those beneficiaries in this picture? And for example, that's the approach that WIN takes, the Water Infrastructure uh, Innovation Act. When we're looking at the Shasta, the water contractors would be paying into that. A single beneficiary is the main outcome there, whereas if we put that into the watershed, we would all be beneficiaries. So in short, working with natural infrastructure is a win, 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 win. Uh, whether it is for the watersheds themselves and those communities, for the recipients of the water in the bottom part of the state as a local source of economic development, or for the fish and wildlife uh, that are a key part of the heritage of this state. Uh, the outcomes we have significantly increased the water security for the state and the much more climate resilient water supply writ large. Thank you.